I am in a way an alchemist in as I've taken the energy of my thoughts and I've then converted them into a new form of energy mm. called this service or this product or this whatever. And fuck, that was like the happiest I've ever been. Climbing trees, like I was like, fuck yeah, this is sweet. Mm -hmm. I loved climbing trees as a kid. If I can catch your attention with the bait of my words, I have cast a spell and Ooh. caught you. Let's imagine that I'm a man who is engaging in a heterosexual relationship with a female, yes, and I'm, I'm wanting to engage in sexual intercourse. How much pleasure is she going to get out of it if everything is soft? When you, as a man, enter a room, there should be a felt presence that, okay, this guy's got his shit together. Like, If you look at the best innovations over time and you ask the creators or inventors what they were doing when they had it, rarely is it I was grinding for the 12th hour and I had this great idea. It was I had been grinding for 12 hours and I needed a break, so I went and took a shower. Yeah. And that's when it hit me. Welcome back to another episode of the Captain's Lifestyle Podcast. This episode was recorded in front of a live audience at The Immersion, which is my rite of passage for men who want to overcome their self-limiting beliefs, challenge their physical and mental capabilities, and party like captains. Brooks Meadows was one of my top choices of guest speakers after attending his workshop on play and experiencing his live performance at the Strong Coach Summit earlier this year in Austin, Texas. As expected, he knocked it out of the park at the immersion, and I will definitely be having him back to present at future immersions. Speaking of which, the next immersion will take place in May of 2023, and the only way to attend is after graduating from the Captain's Lifestyle Program, which is my four-month lifestyle optimization program for impact-driven men who want to consistently maintain healthy habits, build confidence, and have the discipline to stay focused and productive. To apply, visit thecaptainslifestyle.com slash waitlist. All right, now let's get into today's wonderful episode with my friend, Brooks Meadows. Hey, good? Yeah. <laughs> you feeling buzzing? A little bit, yeah. Speaking of which, <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Ketone IQ, specifically their newest edition, their Ketone IQ shots. Oh, beautiful. Let's cheers, buddy. Let, right. Let's get some, some <laughs> more buzzing in here. Why not? Cheers, cheers man. Ketone IQ. You're such a fucking pro, dude. <laughs> How so? It took you 0.5 seconds to launch into the intro. Yeah. Right right into it. Right into it. Uh, that's what happens when you're buzzing on Ketone IQ. Uh, th this stuff, honestly, has been phenomenal. I mean, you guys know I don't promote any bullshit. I only promote stuff that I personally use and believe in. And HVMN is one of those companies. They didn't start off with, uh, I didn't start off with ketone IQ from them. I started with like their uh, collagen powder and some of their keto bars, which are really good. They don't make them anymore or else I would have had those as snacks here. Um, so yeah, uh, to get the hookup on these ketone IQ shots that you can travel with because it's under the arbitrary three ounces <laughs> that you can take on a plane for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, you can throw them in your gym bag. And I put it in my pocket while I did a thousand lunges. So at the halfway point, took it out, boom, energy, almost instantaneous. So you can head over to hvmn.com, use code Captain Morgan to pick yourself up some ketone IQ shots. Uh, speaking of mental clarity and performance, this episode is also brought to you uh, not by my decanter, but by what's inside the Nectar X, say, Newtopia product. And uh, they're also a sponsor of the Captain's Lifestyle Immersion, which is where we are now. Everybody's uh, buzzing on Ketone IQ and Nectar X. So get that mental and physical performance in. Uh, Nootopia makes 100% customized nootropics. So that means that each formulation uh, that you get, well, each order has like nine different stacks that you get. And, and each of those nine stacks are custom tailored to your brain specific neurotransmitter imbalances. So before you order, you got to fill out a questionnaire like, how happy are you? How productive are you? Uh, how how focused, how much focus are you looking to have? What supplements are you currently taking? What's your diet like? How is your sleep? All these things. 
it's based on the Braverman test, which is like the, the gold standard when it comes to uh, checking your neurotransmitters. And then they custom formulate it to you. And so that's why it's hyper effective. All these other ones are uh, over the counter, one size fits all. They may work well for some people. They may not work at all for others, but Newtopia is customized. Uh, so yeah, get the hookup. Use code Captain Morgan at newtopia.com slash Taylor. Last but not least, after a sip, I'll join you. Of Nectar X. This episode is also brought to you by Lambs, which is this EMF blocking clothing that I've got on right now. It's the healthiest apparel you'll ever wear. It's made of silver. What? It's like I'm a fucking king. Literally. Which we will get into <laughs> on this podcast. All right. I'm wearing silver on my head because it blocks up to 99% of harmful electromagnetic fields, which cause oxidative stress in the body that can cause things like headaches and stress and inflammation and trouble sleeping. Um, tinnitus, actually. Mm -hmm. I used to ha have tinnitus after I got out of the Marine Corps. And since rocking the slams gear and turning off Wi-Fi and keeping the phone in airplane mode, I don't remember the last time I had ringing in my ears. Whoa. Like, it's it's crazy. Um, yeah. It's... I, I really can't attribute it back to once I started being more mindful of EMFs. Because before that, it was just like this annoying, like, my ear. Anyways, so yeah, it's brought to you by Lambs. And I've got a present for oh, you, no. sir, as a oh, podcast yes. guest. Beanie, black or gray? What do you think, guys? Black or gray? I go black. Black it is, man. Black, black it, it is. Thank Match you. the outfit. Thank you, Lambs. Yeah. I, I'll put it on now. Go, yeah, go now? for it. We'll, we'll, we'll twin. It. All right, cool. We'll twin. I'm rocking it right now. I slept with this on last night because it acts as not only does it, you know, protect your brain from EMS, but also uh, in the evening, I like to use it as a eye mask. I just pull it all over my head. Like that. I think I'll just record the podcast. Like you look this. like That's Daredevil funny. for real. <laughs> he looks like Daredevil for I real. I don't know who that Dare is. What? I, who's Daredevil? Well, first of all, he's a superhero. Okay. Okay. Goes blind as a young guy, develops a hyper sense of awareness due to his blindness. This isn't he, a popular superhero. I mean, he's pretty popular. He got a show on Netflix. He's and so when he's he like Marvel or DC? Yeah, or? yeah, it'd be Marvel. So when he really? first starts and he doesn't have a superhero costume, he, he does that exactly. He pulls his thing over his eyes because he doesn't need them. Everybody's like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fuck this guy up." He doesn't have eyes, and then it's it's Daredevil. So, what's his power? He can like see in the Matrix. Yeah, and it's like, uh, so imagine you could see in the red light, how you can see in the red light. That's what his vision looks like mm. behind his eyes. Is that he's uh, almost created like bat sonar in his brain from all of his senses, and he can actually see what's happening. It just doesn't look like vision like you or I have. It That's would just be cool. like people lit on fire, can see the heat, like Neo saw in the Matrix. And exactly but it's not computer solids. codes it's yeah. just it's heat okay cool. and he's got it down and Sweet. you look like him so all right go for I'll, I'll take that all right thanks lambs lambs appreciate you dot com use code lambs. yeah get lambs.com use code captain morgan that will save you i believe 10 percent on the world's healthiest apparel uh sweet all right now let's dive into the <clears throat> nitty-gritty of brooks meadows who yeah. i'm joined by this is the king. He's king going, of what? The king, the of, king what? of storytelling. All right. I'll take that. I'll take that. This man is one of the best storytellers I have personally ever heard. And I knew I had to get him for the Captain's Lifestyle Immersion because I, I know that all of you guys will love his amazing storytelling abilities to close out the Captain's Lifestyle Immersion. You are you are the closing ceremony. How I does am, that feel? I'm the closer. Yeah. Uh, in baseball, I... I, I carved out a little niche for myself as coming in towards the end of the game to solidify everything. Is that just because you were on the bench the first eight innings? Or? Yeah, well, the way pitching works is that everybody gets a particular <laughs> role. You have starters, and then you have middle relievers, and then you have closers, and I was a closer. Uh, and plus, I just like to watch Dave and uh, Chase do all the heavy lifting with thing. you guys. They get you guys nice and cracked open for me, and then I get to come in and have the get to have the fun. <laughs> Yeah, they, they've been crushing it. Always. Dude. Always. Watching they, them work together is a real treat. They are professionals. You are professional. And uh, yeah, very familiar with pitching. You, did you know my dad was a professional baseball player? Tell me about it. 
he played uh, professionally up to triple a spring training of triple a for the blue jays wow. organization as a pitcher yo it's a hard it's a hard life i remember growing up as a kid thinking that's what i wanted to be as i grew up you gotta and, put uh, everything into it yeah oh yeah uh I've everything seen but you know what those guys do also what they game like you wouldn't believe they oh, spend yeah. so much time in the bullpen no, nah, not in the bullpen, but just oh. in life outside of the outside of the games. Like, huh. dude, it just in a way, uh, uh, being a pro athlete is not nearly what you would imagine it is uh, because the training is work. So it's not nearly as fun. And the way that they decompress from all that stuff, a lot of them yeah. they just play games, man. Just chill. And they go out and try to, you know, uh, be social. Play games. Let's let's talk a little bit about playing games. Actually, before we get into that, because this is Brooke's specialty is. Play and storytelling, two things we've lost lost touch with in modern society. Everything's bland and boring now, for the most part. And there's so one of my biggest inspirations. Uh, his name is Chris Moore. Chris Moore founded the Barbell Shrugged podcast out of Memphis, Tennessee. It became the number one fitness podcast in the world. <clears throat> and uh, this is a lot of the things that we're able to do YouTube shows being fit and all of this, a lot of that started with these guys doing this. Uh, and Chris would have been the spirit of this show. He died tragically young at the age of 36. He was known as the barbell Buddha. And one of his favorite quotes and one that I'll quote here, he said, the greatest sin in life is to be fucking boring. Oh, right. Cause you, you can, there's a lot of things I can't change. I can't always change uh, my bone structure. I can't change my height. Yeah. But I can learn a good story and it, learn how to tell it with just enough to get a laugh or to get a, a wow, you know, just to add some flavor to the mix. So I prefer to add some flavor to the mix where I go uh, in a world of blandness and everybody thinking the same way. Yeah. A lot of guys today struggle with confidence. And confidence doesn't have to have anything to do with physical looks. Like, obviously, you can't change the structure of your face. Yes, if you're overweight, you can reduce your body fat and decrease inflammation, which will allow you to, you know, look like have a clearly defined jaw structure and breathing through your nose actually mm -hmm. helps with that as well. You can lose weight, you can be fit, but still some of the most muscular and seemingly attractive guys still have all these insecurities and they don't know how to actually talk to people. And dude, I've seen some of the most confident guys on earth that got a belly hanging out over their belt and they got a hot woman on their side and they don't give a fuck what anybody thinks about them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So confidence uh, in our Dave and I, Dave Robinson and I, we have a coaching company. We have two coaching companies. One is for executive men and uh, we talk about the three S's of being a modern man. Modern men need to be safe. They need to be sexy and they need to be secure. Okay. Love it. Safe. Do I, do I give the present when I'm present in the room? Do I give a sense that I am a safe man? A lot of us would have had experience around men that didn't feel safe to be around. Yeah. Yes. And uh, in the current climate <clears throat> that we live in, and I think uh, in a way for the better, it's a requirement of a modern man <clears throat> to show up as safe and feeling safe. And, Safety is also a personal responsibility. So modern men know how to defend themselves and defend their family. That's another way that we can create safety. The sexy one is has very little to do with, with looks and mostly to do with your internal environment. I feel sexy when I'm turned on by my work. Mm. I feel sexy when I'm pouring into my relationship with my wife and thinking ahead about how I can make the relationship special. That makes me feel sexy, right? And when I emote that level of sexiness, my wife picks up on that and it creates a beautiful polarization because now that I'm safe and sexy, she can feel safe enough to relax into her feminine mm. and I get to be more masculine and it creates a polarization. Polarization in relationships is a often may misunderstood very often very often misunderstood <clears throat> and then the third the third one just to close it off is secure um, there's a lot to that feeling secure in who i am as a person and uh, financial security is another form of feeling secure and so modern day like 
men need to take care of their finances in order mm -hmm. to experience a sense of security for themselves. So uh, we get on all those three things. Very little of it has to do with your physical look. And a lot of it has to do with the way that you're presenting out in the world from the inside. And once you're confident in yourself and presenting your skills, abilities, your physical appearance starts to come into check. Right? A lot of it is because you take pride in what you look like. Exactly. You it's, but I get to then define what I think looks good. Mm -hmm. And that's the other part is like, am I defining what looks good because I saw it on Instagram? Uh, and maybe because I saw that and I was like, that turned me on in a sense, like, oh, I like that shirt, you know, like that seems like me. Uh, or am I doing it because I want to try to fit into this other crowd? Am I wearing a suit because I'm trying to play the business savvy guy or because I'm actually business savvy? You know, I, if I'm business savvy, maybe I don't need the suit so much to present as that person. Uh, a lot of times we put on our uh, our costume to play the role that we want. And uh, the cool thing is, is we can wear many costumes if we find it, you know, worth our time. You can wear whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. <clears throat> That's Jeremiah is rocking the fucking his top hat with the fucking Nordic like scripture uh, tracksuit. That was legit, that's, man. That's baller. And then I you, haven't seen the Nordic Scripture tracksuit. I'm not going to lie. We like tracksuits in our friend circle, as you can likely tell. And I had never seen that one, so I was impressed. Yeah, and then y'all roll up from the airport, all rocking your matching Got to do tracksuits. Yeah. When the when the captain takes care of you, you're going to be seen on the plane. You show up. You show up in the tracksuits. Yeah. Uh, we knew that we knew that was it. That yeah. started between uh, just a little history here. It started between Mark England, creator, co-creator of Enlifted, and Mike Bledsoe, also who co-founded Barbell Shrug, the biggest fitness podcast in the world. Now the leader of the Strong Coach community. Those two showed up uh, at an event wearing track suits, and it was just like game over, dude. Game over, game and all of a sudden there was like a fleet of track suits going from yeah. place to place. That's how I first heard of. Uh, Mark England, and it wasn't lifted at the time. It was Pro Cabulary. Yep, on his podcast with Mike Bledsoe on Barbell Shrugged way back in 2016. I didn't take action on it then. So I was still a a CrossFit coach. I knew that that was something that I wanted to do, <clears throat> but I I wish I would have gotten got in on it early. You know, because let's talk about language. Let's go a little bit. Language yeah. is fucking powerful. Well, it's literal magic. How about that? <laughs> Literally. Talk Liter to us about it. Literal magic. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's talk about what magic is uh, and maybe what it's not. Uh, literal magic is, in a way, alchemy. And alchemy is turning something from one element to another. Oh. All right. Let's play the – let's use our – let's go into the theater of our mind, everybody. Let's imagine for a moment. Mm. You're living in a different time and in a different era, <clears throat> an era where we don't have maybe so much uh, modern technology to navigate our way through the world. And there are these groups of scholars in a way called alchemists. And most people think about alchemists as turning lead into gold. And I can leave open to the possibility that that's literally true. But let's also imagine that these were really smart people, too. And when they created ideas and frameworks, they weren't simply speaking only literally. Sometimes concepts can be used to help us understand the way that the world works. Okay. So the air element is my mind. Yeah. Mm. The water element are my emotions. Mm. The fire element is my spirit. And the earth element is things that are in manifest tangible okay. tangible things so in a way if i have a business idea in my mind and i create a product mm -hmm. i am in a way an alchemist in as i've taken the energy of my thoughts and i've then converted them into a new form of energy mm -hmm. called this service or this product or this whatever okay so how did we create something from nothing magic we learned how to speak it we were able to take this energy in our mind 
Yes. And then create a new type of energy through our words and through our vocal cords that became language. Mm. Language is a technology. All right. Now, in the English language, uh, we have a word that is used when we take letters and pack them together to create a word. We used to do competitions when we were in grade school. Do you remember what these competitions were called? Spelling bees. Spelling bees. Well, if words weren't magic, why would we be spelling them? Spelling them. We are spelling the act of casting spells. I learned from Mark England, uh, England, what is a spell? A spell is a word or a series of words with great influence, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary. So if I am creating influence with my words, I'm casting a spell. You want to play, you want to do some word games? Let's play some word games. All right. What else do we cast? We cast spells, right? What else do we cast? Fishing line. We, ca we go fishing and we cast a line. Yes. What are we trying to catch? Fish. Cool. So if I cast a spell, what am I trying to catch? Oh. Your attention. If I can catch your attention with the bait of my words, I have cast a spell and Ooh. caught you. So we also use words in other contexts that when you put them in a other context, they make other things make new kinds of sense. Yes. So I'm trying to cast my spell so I can catch your attention. You know that phrase? Did I catch your attention? Mm. Catch your attention. Yes. But the cool thing about uh, fishing is, you know, not everybody can just cast a line and catch a fish. Why? Because there's technique. So if I'm trying to cast a spell uh, or cast a line and I cast it this way, there's no fish back there. There's only fish out here. Right. So I could learn how to cast spells incorrectly and they have no effect. Mm. They won't be a spell if they have no influence or even a deleterious effect. Exactly. So if as long as it's if it's neutral, then it's not a spell. Right. Because it has to have influence. Mm. Right. Negative or positive. So if it's neutral, there's no casting of the spell. So if I'm I'm not actually casting my fishing line in this direction because it's completely neutral. I've given myself no chance to catch that fish. Yes. But then. If I do finally get to learn how to cast them in the right direction, I still have to have the right bait. And if you use the wrong bait to catch the wrong fish, you're also not going to get it. Yeah, so words, we choose the words as bait so we can catch people's attention with the, scale, the, the spells that we cast out there. What's coming to mind for me with this is we get – a lot of people allow themselves to be so influenced by the spells of other people. Influenced, in fluidity, okay? I'm in fluidity if I'm influenced. I'm being pushed in a particular direction. I'm influenced, mm -hmm. okay? Influent. All right, keep going. <clears throat> and then I, I tell them to imagine if that person was speaking another language to you. What if they were still talking, saying words, but you had no idea what they were saying. It, it wouldn't register to you. So you don't have to let these person's words or spells actually influence you. Right? I've heard, uh, I believe the actress was Selma Hayek. Selma Hayek made this point. Spanish is her native language. Somebody yells and says some really nasty things to her in Spanish. She'll get very emotional. Somebody comes and speaks a language to her that they don't understand, says the same energy, same, but she has no impact on her because there's because right? it's not a spell. It's, it's not a spell to her. Completely neutral, has no influence. Hmm. Yeah. So you have to have uh, influence in order to really be casting spells. So what's the difference between casting good magic and dark magic? Like, how can we make our spells effective? What comes to mind is intent. First step is knowing the intent of the spell that I'm casting. I think a lot of people don't think of their intent. I completely agree with you. Most people don't think about the intent of their words. That's why the work that we're doing is having such an impact because it's simply drawing awareness onto what they're saying. Stage one is, okay, now I'm aware of what I'm saying, which is great. It's a great first step. What follows very shortly behind is that now that you're focused on yourself, your reticular activating system is at 
turned on to language and now you hear it in everybody else you hear all the soft talk you hear all the negations you hear all the projections and you're looking around at people going oh listen to that soft talk oh god a little oh yeah nice projection there oh i'm all in lifted coaches oh my everybody who gets turned on to this work i'm gonna use the absolute here on purpose everybody that gets turned on to this work has that moment where they can't help but hear all of everybody else language and with it attached some level of judgment (laughs) then you Again, you you do the reps enough, you're like, oh, I'm catching myself, I'm live translating myself, um, and that becomes, you know, you become a word wizard that way when you're live translating or you pause before you say the word that you were gonna say. <clears throat> yeah, that's how I tell my clients to measure progress, because I'm sure you've experienced this. A lot of clients get overwhelmed and they're trying to do everything perfect. Like they learn all this new information, and they're like, why can't I just do this? Like I still got to do that. I'm not implementing this. So that's great understand your enthusiasm, your excitement. I love it. And this is how we measure progress. The distance between what you said versus realizing what you would have said had you been conscious of what you were actually saying. The closer we can move that in to where, as you mentioned, you're making real-time corrections in your language. That's why you'll hear some of the enlifted coaches say soft-talking knowledge or negation acknowledge because real-time we're still in these old language habits. So it still sometimes comes up, but because we're so conscious of it, yes. it's like, Oh, that was soft talk, soft talk, acknowledge. I acknowledge what I said. I actually meant this. Correct. Uh, that's a big part of it is. And then again, mastery level above that is filtering it out and not having to acknowledge it because that you've already, you've <clears throat> already filtered it out of your language to a large degree, which then gives you another level of mastery, which is where you actually use them for emphasis. You use them on purpose. You can use negations. Mm. You can use projections. You just use them on purpose to create an effect. And that's what I <clears throat> see Mark do all, often is that he will use <clears throat> them on purpose to emphasize whatever he's trying to do. The, mm. the point is to get out of the mindless usage of this language because then you're you're not steering your experience. You're being led or uh, influenced, yeah. <laughs> channeled, influenced <clears throat> by language that is absent-minded or subconscious. So how how can people, like what what's maybe top three, maybe most important step, how people can go from unconscious on autopilot to conscious of these things becoming the captain of their own life using their words i know at this moment in my life no better way to do that than to practice the four step and lifted method at this point in my life my my genuine honest answer is the four step and lifted method which we have been doing all weekend all weekend and this is and uh, we'll continue to do in the in lifted community. They say this information is open source. So if you go to an open source website, you can actually see behind the curtain and see what the codes are made of. All right. And you could change them. So Mark and Adam, they created the Enlifted method to be open source on purpose. So they're up front what the four steps are. Step one, if you have. If you want to get clear on your language or your experience, pick a memory that has been bothering you, write it down, title it and write it down. That's step one every time. Uh, I've written down many stories. Many of them I used to journal, but journaling ended up being this endless exercise that had no beginning or ending. So when you write it, write it like you were going to write a movie script, Mm -hmm. write it like a scene where it would have a beginning an opening part and a close and an ending part. And you know, when the scene is done, that's step one, title it, write it down. Step two, read it out loud. When you read it out loud, you're likely, depending on how strong the influence is of the story, you may read it really fast, which is fine. Uh, You may miss some of the words that you were using because you're trying to get through it. So when we get to step number three, you've read it in step two. Step three is you slow it down. You read it at 70% the rate of speech. That is often, that step three is often where people get the space and clarity. Again, everybody has their own space and clarity moment at different stages. I found in my experience, stage three, when they're slowing it down, they get the space away and they say, 
oh, I noticed I used that word. I noticed I used that word because I've slowed it down. And then uh, once you've read it at the lower rate of speech, you check in again, step number four, you read it. And after every period, uh, most commas and some breaks in the sentence where you would naturally take a breath, slow it down. And once you've done that, you can revise it. So another term that's often used in and lifted is draft, craft, and supercharge. So if you've written down the tough memory, you've drafted it. If you'd like to craft it and you'd like to turn it into something that is an empowering story, you take some of those sentences that were maybe hard to read, hard to write down. You analyze them. And did I write down something like this always happens to me? Or I never get what I want. You know, these are very dramatic statements. And can I take some of the charge out of them by going, I sometimes get what I want. Maybe not as often as I'd like, but I sometimes get what I want. Okay, well, that's better than never. It's less potent. It's less charged. It's like, okay, it's an acknowledgement that sometimes I get my way. And you get to see, is that accurate? It's like, actually, you know, it turns out I get my way a lot. In fact, I often get my way. And now I've crafted it into something like that's now getting supercharged. Like I often get my way because I'm very influential. And it went from, I never get my way to, I often get my way because I'm influential. And now I have a supercharged statement that I can go back to when I may, maybe not feeling so influential and be like, right. I get this because I'm influential. Great. This is a big, big jump from where we started. So I think that <clears throat> maybe just a little bit that this could possibly tie in to even just a little bit raising your level of confidence and how you show up and, and speak. Could possibly, could possibly if I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Taylor's using all the soft words there, right? It's as soft as it gets. Um, in other words, how the fuck you talk determines how confident you are as a man. All right, listen, uh, this is this is this is a men's immersion. Can we be a little masculine and manly on this one? All right, we're going to use our language to be a little masculine and manly. If you're listening out there and you have sensitive ears, you know, it's a hey, listen, take a breath, <laughs> keep it low and slow in the belly, you're going to be fine. Let's imagine that I'm a man who is engaging in a heterosexual relationship with a female. Yes. And I'm, I'm wanting to engage in sexual intercourse. How much pleasure is she going to get out of it if everything is soft? <laughs> Just a limp dick, soft, no texture, no commitment. How much pleasure is she going to get out of that? Very little. It's the same thing with our words. Hey, maybe you might kind of want to go out with me on Saturday. I mean, maybe we could go to the movies. I don't know. But would you maybe <laughs> want to go to dinner? She's going to be like, Ugh. what the fuck? No, you want to give her that solid talk. Mm. Okay. That solid talk looks like, hey, I happen to notice you across the room. And I felt very attracted to you in the moment in the most respectful way, are you open to getting to know each other and going to dinner with me on Saturday? You go up and say that, that is a different kind of interaction. Mm. It's solid. Okay. We, we romanticize ourselves guys. We're in a consistent process of wooing ourselves into getting some outcome work related, relationship related. We're internally wooing ourselves. So if we're being soft, we're giving ourselves that limp, non-committal soft. Like it's not attractive. It's not sexy. Let's let's make this <clears throat> um distinction here because I think a lot of men hear this and they're like, okay, so I have to be like uh, Assertive and dominating, like, yes, you do. And that doesn't mean that you have to... Assertive, may, assertive yes. Dominating, no. I, I, I will pull back on the dominating thing. Uh, some people can like the dominating. I would imagine dominating as a, in, as a first go-to attribute. Assertive is good. Dominating, maybe not so much. But continue <clears throat> with your question. Yeah, what I meant more by dominating is, like, have a dominating presence when you enter the room. Totally. 
which goes to what you were saying, like when you, as a man enter a room, there should be a felt presence that, okay, this guy's got his shit together. Like he going back to, to what you said about being safe, like men should be able to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, usually the loudest person in the room is the, uh, the least confident or, uh, less able to handle situations. Not always. Right? And being Not loud always. is a great defense mechanism. Uh, a bear walks up to you in the woods. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed <sighs> to get big and loud. Being big and loud is a great way to protect yourself when you feel that you're at a disadvantage. So mm -hmm. it's no surprise that it shows up in the bars or in, you know, mm -hmm. you have a lot of people wanting to feel safe. They don't feel safe in a crowd. Get big and loud. Nobody come over here. Yeah. I'm off limits. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, guess what? You, it, it works. Wow. <laughs> it works. So <clears throat> let's, let's talk about how this can be balanced. So yes, have your assertive and dominating presence, like just be so sure of yourself. And that doesn't mean losing touch with who you are. And this is one of Brooke's specialties as well is understanding the importance of letting the fuck loose mm -hmm. and playing, especially for, you know, alpha men who are so driven in typically entrepreneurial pursuits. They get so caught up in that, that they lose touch with everything that they enjoy doing, hanging out with their family, playing with their kids. Talk to us about how detrimental that is. Well, before I do that, I want to talk to you about what your life was like before realizing that and what your life was like after realizing that. Let's do it. Let's go. So <clears throat> I, I had always been a, a very playful, happy, excited kid. Uh, and let's see, I'm, I'm trying to imagine when this was reprogrammed in me you know going through school you're always taught to sit still shut up follow the rules right which i always hated i'm sure if i would have would have been going to school now i would have been diagnosed with like adhd or something you know guys aren't supposed to be sitting young kids aren't supposed to be sitting down paying attention for eight hours a day right we're supposed to be up moving and playing and same thing at work, you know, going through the Marine Corps, everything is very structured and rigid. Um, and then you look at examples of leaders or entrepreneurs who are su successful, and there's different visions of what successful is. And then you see it's all about the hustle, the grind, the, the work, work, work. You got to wake up early, work all day, and then start over. It's like, yes, but where's the balance in that? So I got too caught up in, in the one caring what other people thought of me. And if I fit in, right. Like, is this okay for me to do? Like, I kind of want to dance right now, but I don't know how to dance. Is, are these people going to judge me? Mm -hmm. You know? So mm -hmm. it's like that lack of self-confidence and lack of certainty of who I am that held me back as well. And then, so when I came to the strong coach summit and you gave your, your seminar on play there, that was like liberating for me because here I am thinking I've got, you know, most things in order in my life and I fucking forgot how to play. And so you were like, yeah, okay. For the next 10 minutes, a little sneak preview for what you guys have in store. I don't know what he has planned specifically, but uh, he was like, okay, for the next 10 minutes, go fucking play. You can wrestle with somebody. You can play basketball. You can you know, whatever. I didn't even say that. <clears throat> it was like 10 minutes, three, two, one, go. And I ran away from the circle <laughs> and I got in the monkey bars. Yeah. And just lead by example. Like kids, adults need to be led as well. It's a human quality that most, uh, most human beings need a model to live into, especially if they've forgotten it. So mm -hmm. uh, it's very challenging for an individual or a group to become something that they cannot imagine or hold an image for in their head. Okay. So much so that we have a term used for these special type of people that are able to cast their vision forward and then create it something from nothing that nobody's ever done before that nobody's ever envisioned before they can envision it and bring it into manifest. We call them visionaries. 
And we like, wow, Steve Jobs, what a visionary. He had an idea of something. It's like nobody could have thought of that. And they go out and get it. So this is actually a rare quality, which is why modeling is so important. So instead of trying to tell them up mm -hmm. here, this is what you have can do. You know, that's that's what school does to you. This is what your options are. You know, that's not as much play as you might imagine if I have to tell you what your options are. Mm -hmm. Play is a natural state of being where my curiosity is very present and it allows for a lot of things. So I just modeled it by running away. And then I turned around once I got there and there was a couple of different categories going on. There were some that were like, oh, I get this shit. I remember this shit. And they were already like in a tree or playing basketball or whatever. And then there were some adults that were frozen. What's happening? frozen what do i do now exactly what no instructions <gasps> don't know how to be and that's essentially the point of that particular exercise in that moment was like oh damn i have forgotten a very natural trait that was so easy to fall into as an adult uh, as a child and then i learn as an adult that or i'm at least prescribed this idea that being an adult and playing are somehow at odds. And as we'll likely get into, they are not only not at odds, but play is an essential part of the human experience. And it is a litmus test for your quality of life. Oh, absolutely. Because let me tell you, uh, three, two, one, go. I looked around and I was like, okay, uh, everybody's kind of doing something with somebody else and I am left out. Cause I was one of the ones who was like, what, what do I do? I don't, I'm not comfortable. So I was like, okay, what did I like doing as a kid? And then I just started climbing trees and fuck. That was like the happiest I've ever been climbing trees. Like I was like, fuck yeah, this is sweet. Mm -hmm. I loved climbing trees as a kid. Me too. And so I just, I started doing that and I was like, wow. Yeah. Quality of life instantly went up and and we can do that whenever wherever so talk to us more about uh how and why we should start incorporating play sure into our lives um well anybody, without going too in depth because we'll, yeah we'll sure do a whole seminar and then you know fortunately we'll yeah. they, a lot of this will be new to anybody who hears it so the definitive book on play in the academic world is by uh dr stuart brown and he wrote a book called Play. It's roughly 200 pages of really wonderful context for being a human being. Uh, play, like I said, as a litmus test for your quality of life. Uh, it's also a signal physiologically to your body that uh, you're in peril. So when play or enjoyment disappears from your life, your body believes that it's in danger. And even if there's no physical danger mm -hmm. present, your body responds physiologically to the danger with stress and stress hormones, which yeah. reduces your day-to-day -day quality of life and over time and increases your risk of disease. Yeah, we, we cannot create from a place of survival. So if we're in this, you know, when you guys first get into the ice bath, <laughs> breathing through the mouth, into the chest, you're, you're stressing yourself out. You think you can create a beautiful picture when you're stressed out, like trying to, to paint. No, you can't. Same thing when you're running away from a uh, lion, like you're not worried about creating anything. You're worried about getting the fuck out of there. Totally. So same thing. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. You're not worried about creation of any sort. Um, if you're so stressed out about your work, you're, you're, you're going to be less effective in your work as an entrepreneur, especially who, you know, that's a very creative thing. So no doubt about always it. in this fight or flight. You can never be in rest, digest, play, and create. Correct. Uh, if you look at the best innovations over time and you ask the creators or inventors what they were doing when they had it, rarely is it I was grinding for the 12th hour and I had this great idea. No. It was I had been grinding for 12 hours and I needed a break, so I went and took a shower. Yeah. And that's when it hit me. Right? So there's a couple of qualities that need to be present for this state. I want to, you can define play a lot of different ways. Uh, I want to avoid defining play as an activity and more defining it as a state of being. So in the state of play, there are some qualities that must be present. And the number one pillar is a sense of safety. Like safety is critical. So in uh, my world, I also work with companies 
and companies that want to improve their corporate culture and they want to prove, improve the innovation. And uh, then I go in and I do a talk and I open up a possibility with an endless, you know, the, uh, what would you call them? Like an open-ended question. That's what it is. And I send it to the field and no hands go up. And it's just like, there's this looming sense of, Oh, what happens if I get it wrong? Mm -hmm. And if you're scared of being wrong, innovation can't happen because innovation being wrong is the majority of your experience in innovation. And in fact, it's the overwhelming majority of, of the experience that you have in innovation is to be wrong about stuff. So um, I noticed that those things are at odds, right? You have to feel safe in order to be innovative and to experience the state of play where innovation happens. Second one, and this is almost going to seem like a paradox, but it, but I assure you that it's not. It needs to be slightly risky or at the edge of your ability mm. because it requires, when it's towards the edge of your ability, heightened amount of focus. Yeah, I can only have that focus when I feel safe, but now that I feel safe in my environment, I need to practice something that's just at the edge of my skills. Uh, so a simple way I, I think about it, I used to practice on a balance beam. I wanted to improve my balance, so I built a little rail. The rail was six inches off the ground. I felt super safe. I could explore and I got really good and I could practice. But then I tried to, you know, do one six feet above the ground because we had a parkour studio. So it was like six feet above the ground is a lot different than six inches above the ground. And it took me a long time before I could enter the state of play at the six foot because I didn't feel safe. I didn't have enough reps. But over time, the threshold just kept getting pushed out of what I felt safe. And then before you know it, I was walking back six feet off the ground. I was just like back and forth on the, on the bar. No problem. Isn't it funny <clears throat> how our brains create <clears throat> the different responses like same bar right one six inches one six feet S technically same exact thing that you're doing exactly physically and i could walk minutes on the lower rail and never be at, a, at like uh, minutes on end and you get up on the high one and you're like oh yeah yeah it's crazy how the brain does that so uh continue you're on two did, did you say that there were three uh i said there were a couple uh Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's gotta be interesting. It's gotta be, you know, it, it has yeah. to be of interest of inclination, you know, because again, it's not an activity. Mm. It's a state of being while doing an activity. So the way that you like to play and the, what I, the way I like to play will be different. And part of our workshop will be, today will be breaking down what are the main uh, archetypes of play personalities to give you guys some room to explore ways that you could play and include play into your daily life. Uh, but I also want to dispel a possible notion that w the opposite of play is work and the opposite of work is play. Um, it's not accurate. Uh, I uh, Play is a performance enhancing drug for your work. It has been shown through a lot of different uh, scientific studies that your ability to process information and learn goes up by a thousand percent when you enter the state of play. That's a 10x speed of implementation on information when you're doing it in a game, which is why there was a huge rush to gamify everything a while back. I think a lot of these people missed the mark because yeah. again, you can only enter the gamify and play state on things that people actually want to gamify. Yeah. And uh, not everybody wanted to gamify their work or, you know, have a pool table or a ping pong table in the break room. You know, that's not what play is necessarily. So um, again, consider that, the reason that this is valuable if you were a high performer is that it improves performance. Yes. Mm. However, you got to play to play. If you're playing to improve performance, you have a point that's not going to work. That's a mm. bit of a paradox. If I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to play right now so I can improve my performance. Mm. Right. Then that, you're going to be all in your head. Exactly. Cause you're task oriented and you're not entering into the state of play. So again, it's, you, I didn't want to define it strictly because there are some, there's malleability to this concept that is a little bit of a, it depends, you know, yeah. because it depends on, I think where we started, like the spells, it depends on your intent. I go to play because I need a break, not because I'm trying to have a breakthrough. Yeah. I play because I need a break, not because I need a breakthrough. Hmm. And if you're playing for a breakthrough, you haven't played for long enough. 
or yeah. you haven't played. You're not playing. Yeah. You're if right. you're playing for a breakthrough, you're not actually playing. You're now task oriented mm. and you're trying to get there through a new channel. Especially for men, we're so left brain dominant. Like we're so logical and in our head all the time. It's most of very the time. common and very often. Most of for me, I know that this is one of the the areas that I'm working to improve is I'm I'm always so logical and I have to think about the explanation, like how does this thing exist or what is the mechanism behind it or whatever. And so play, as as I've said, was was phenomenal for me to get out of my head and just express myself. Like if you're thinking about what you're going to do next or what anybody's thinking about you, you're not in the state of play because play is just flowing. You're just doing. That's why I liked what you said about how it has to be just on the outside of your comfort zone. Right. I read this book, um, was the art of impossible by Stephen Kotler, Mm -hmm. who's a, Mm -hmm. a high performance psychologist. And that's what he talks about. He's like these athletes who get into flow state. Yes. They're doing the, the same thing like day after day, but they keep increasing the level of, of intensity, uh, or skill that is required to achieve it to keep them at that edge. No doubt. That's what they keep getting progressively better and better. And uh, Patagonia, Yvonne Sherard, Sh- I, I don't know how to say his last name, but he's the CEO of Patagonia. Um, and I haven't read it, but the book, Let My People Surf by him, mm-hmm. he, he talks about, I, I don't know what he talks about, but this is what I've been told about the book mm-hmm. that at Patagonia, it's, you can take a surf break whenever you want. So if you, it's, if it's in the middle of a meeting and there's good surf out and you feel like you need a break, go out and surf, which is fantastic for flow state. Yep. And Nike has a similar policy. Uh, if you have a, an appointment with somebody at the racquetball court or the basketball court and your meeting's running long. Like it's totally cool to just get up and walk out be like, dude, I got a two o'clock. I'm on the basketball court with Jeremy, you know? So mm. like, I got to get out there and need a break. Uh, and again, I work in corporate culture also. A lot of times companies are hesitant to try to implement something like that because they're, <laughs> because it's not the personality of the company. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, or they think it's taking away from productivity when in fact it's just the opposite. Well, and that's what I, my argument to someone like that is usually um, this do you, I'll ask by being inquisitive, do you, are you a type of person that prefers making data driven decisions? And they're like, yeah. I'm mm. like, great. Is that why you want people to work more? Cause this is a data driven decision. You're like, yep, data. I'm like, all right, here's the data that shows you that you're wrong. Here's the data that shows you that you're wrong that you should have a constant email t- in touch by email culture. Oh, no. Here's the data that shows that you're wrong. Why? Because it takes roughly 45 minutes on average to ramp into a peak flow state. Hmm. And if somebody, and you can hold it for about 90 minutes. So you can ramp up. It takes you about 45 minutes. You can hit a peak. You can hold that for another roughly 45 minutes. And then you start hitting the decline. So the real skill of work is to pocket yourself in those two hour blocks where you spend 90 minutes ramping yourself up, 30 minutes decompressing, 90 minutes ramping up, 30 minutes decompressing and repeating that cycle, you'll get way more done. Because here's the thing, if at minute 33 or 37, like right when you're tipping into flow state, you get an email pops in that pulls away from your focus, you got to start all over again. And so now they're telling me, oh, I don't know why I need to drive them harder. So my people will be more productive. And I'm like, all right, that has one recipe or there's only one outcome on that recipe and it's burnout. It's the only way. That's the only outcome when you work people that way is burnout. So again, uh, I here's the data that shows you that that's not the case. Uh, if you want to choose to ignore this data, well, let's get back to words. Um, you're ignorant. Oh man, can we? This is a little switch gears, but this is a great. I love yeah. this. All right, yeah. wordplay. Uh, what does ignorant mean? Not knowing. Not knowing. He says. Anybody from the crowd? What does ignorant mean? Oblivious. Oblivious. You got oblivious, not open to new ideas, not open to new ideas, oblivious, not knowing. I bet if I say the word differently, you will know exactly what it means. Are you ready? Ignorant. 
<laughs> ignorant. Oh, if I'm being is. ignorant, what is required? What is ignorant? You don't care about whatever it is that you're learning or you're not paying attention. Ignoring something is when you know that it exists and you choose not to look at it. So if I'm ignorant, it requires me having the information. Hmm. However, the way that ignore, ignorant is used and who likes being called ignorant? That negative charge, that sting of the word ignorant, ignorant requires a little more understanding. Oh, okay. So if ignorant doesn't mean not knowing, if it means I know and choose to do something mm -hmm. different, why do we use that word? Well, it's because we don't have a, it, we have a lack in our lexicon of another word to describe that. So we use the word ignorant inappropriately to apply to this situation. And that causes a lot of conflict because that is a conflict word. And in the society we live in now, ignorant is, is thrown around a lot to be a charged word. Yeah. Okay. Now I could argue uh, for a while that I think there's a reason that uh, it's become common in our common English to use ignorant there. A, a part of it is to polarize people on purpose. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys a new word. Okay. Nascent. Nescient. Nescient, N-E-S-C-I-E-N-T, nescient, 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 believe it's nescient, okay, S-C-I-E-N, what is that starting to seem like, S-C, huh, science. science, okay, nay science, no science, what is science, knowledge, nascent, no knowledge, so if I'm nascent, I don't have the information. If I'm making a mistake, it's because I don't have the information. Well, a lot of us have been in a situation where we didn't have the information. There's a lot of innocence mm -hmm. in not having the information. So, uh, you know, one thing, that, one word that has a lot of charge, for example, uh, and I grew up in a city where this was a, co a prominent conversation, um, and that's racism. You're a racist. Yes. Well, like racism by definition is a belief, an internal belief that one race or ethnicity is has more value than another. Yeah. Which I've met a lot of people, vast, overwhelming majority don't qualify in the belief that one ethnicity has more inherent value than another anymore. But they may do something that's racially insensitive that would be called ignorant when really it's nascent. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't understand that what they said or did was offensive to a culture. I lived in a I lived in South Korea. I made many mistakes by Korean cultural standards, let me tell you. Not because I was ig ignorant of them or ignorant of them, it was because I didn't have the knowledge. Fortunately for me, they knew that I was an American, I wasn't Korean, how could I have known? But they and so they're willing to give me more empathy. However, uh, if I was if I had been born Korean American and I went to Korea, they wouldn't have given that individual as much leeway. They might have considered them ignorant because they didn't go along with the culture. So mm -hmm. words have so much power to, uh, especially if we're using them as labels, to create images in our mind and create energy in our body towards another individual or even towards ourselves. That if we then break them down, and I encourage you to now get curious about words that you use on a regular basis. Check out their etymological origins. See what you can figure out. Another one that I like is I play a game with my corporate uh, cor presentations and corporate client clients. I get a whiteboard and I write three words in the left-hand column. The words are lazy, happy, and busy. And in the right-hand column, I spell laziness, L-A-Z-I-N-E-S-S. -S. Second column, happy goes to happiness, H-A-P-P-I-N-E-S-S. -S. And then I leave the bottom right blank. Say fill in the blank. So fill in the blank. What would be if I have lazy, happy, busy, laziness, happiness, busyness, busyness. busyness. How do you spell busyness? Business. Do you? No, but that's what it sounds like. 
Sounds like right. Busyness. Well, b- busyness is, is spelled. Is it I no, it's with a Y. Exactly, exactly. B u s y n e s s is actually how you spell busyness, yep. but in your mind, you likely filled in with an I. With an I, b u s i n e s s, and I was like, that's a funny little word trick. I wonder if there's anything to this. So I decided to get curious and look up the origins of both of these words. It turns out they have the origin in the same word from Old English. B-I-S-I-G-N-I-S. Business, business, however you would have pronounced it in Old English. Literally translated into modern English, anxiety. Hmm. So if abracadabra, with my word I create... What am I creating when I start a business? <laughs> I'm creating busyness or anxiety by definition, which is why you must harmonize this with play. Mm. It's a required essential part of being in business is you have breaks from that. You play. I like to tell my clients to differentiate between busyness and productive it's not they say oh i'm too busy first off no the fuck you're not we all have the same amount of time second off are you busy or are you productive Mm -hmm. a lot of people get caught up in busy work replying to emails as they come in texts as they come in i call those opp (laughs) other people's problems or priorities yeah like if you're spending your days responding to opp like Mm -hmm. you're not gonna have any time or energy for yourself no doubt so that's busyness that's Mm -hmm. having that's taking on everybody else's schedule you need to be productive Mm -hmm. to find what you want and work for those things and play schedule play that's productive and i do i schedule play into my day um it has become a litmus test for my own personal health and well-being that if i'm feeling crunched on something and i give up play for three or four days in a row whether that's Mm -hmm. in the form of an exercise routine or in the form of enjoying time with my wife like that's my litmus test that i'm getting away from the point uh, our friend Ben Walker often says fun is the point, mm. you know, you can have fun at work. Uh, mm. it's, you can have fun. You can be enjoy uh, enjoy while you're at work. It's just whether or not you're willing to dismantle this old belief that play is somehow the antithesis of work because it's not, it's a performance enhancing drug and improves your brain health. Uh, I believe, I think the number is like 63 to 68% less likely to experience Alzheimer's or dementia as an adult or as an old person, if you play regularly or by reversing that you have a 63% increase in chance of developing something like Alzheimer's or dementia simply from getting play out of your life. Uh, And I've heard it often said, basically, if you stop playing, your body believes it's in peril and it stops growing and adapting, which means it's in the retreat. Yeah. Getting older has nothing to like, you don't actually have to feel and get older as you age. Like if you keep moving, you keep playing. They did this study. I'm sure you're familiar with it, where they took a bunch of, I think it was like 60 to 80 year olds. Some like super crippled, like in their walker can barely move. And then they brought them to uh, like a a makeshift town of like when they grew up in the 60s. And they had the whole town was like an actual 60s town. The cars, you go into any of the houses, it's like actually like 60s themed. Like there's kids playing baseball and whatever. And they had these men live there. And sure enough, like the guys in the walkers would start to walk up and be able to move. And like they're living their childhood again. And so it's like, being old is literally just a choice. Yeah. Like you're choosing to stay sedentary. Often it said, if you don't use it, you lose it. Let's yes, translate that. Let's translate that. If you use it, you keep it. Pretty simple. What am I thinking about if I'm saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. I'm thinking about losing it. But if you use it, you keep it. I'm now focused on keeping it. And that's why I dose myself with fun things and play and novelty and uh, expansion, because if you use it, you keep it. If you allow yourself to experience the threshold of your comfort level, you know, you start to keep that. Uh, I'm used to expanding or doing something slightly on the edge of my risk factor, then you're more likely to keep a more robust 
physical experience, personal, uh, spiritual, emotional experience, allowing yourself to engage in something that's, again, safe, but slightly at the edge of your skill set is what allows for you to do that. I mean, basically until you're dead. Sounds good to me. Me too. Y'all want to play? Yeah. Play time? Let's play. Where can we find more about you? Brooks Meadows on Instagram. Chop Club for Men. If you are a busy man that wants to learn how to get healthy while you work, not trying to have you do more stuff, take away time from your family or your business, find us there, Chop Club for Men, uh, online and on Instagram. And then if you're like, hey, I work for a company or I own a company, and this is a really interesting concept, I'd love to know more about that. We have SeriousFun.io is our most recent corporate division, SeriousFun.io. Not on Instagram yet. Uh, but you can find us online. We'll be there. Let's play. Let's go, man. Brooks, thank you for coming on. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate you. Let's have some fun, boys. Let's play.